2 Corinthians chapter number 2, and we will pick up from last week. Now, I, I need a little more, okay? Poor Stephen, you know, I'm never happy. You know, just a little, just a little more volume, otherwise I'm going to have to work too hard. Um, you know, D, DT's not here. Yeah, is he not feeling well this morning? Um, so I'm sorry, DT, if you're watching, um, I'm going to pick on you even if you're not here. <laughs> I had you written in this morning. Um, I know we got a lot of folks out traveling for the Thanksgiving holiday. I hope that if you uh, have a wonderful time with your family. Last week we began a, uh, a series. I really was going to do just two weeks, but I, I just felt I'm going to slow down and we're going to go three weeks with it. Uh, I discovered a new word last week, uh, a suicide. Y'all like that last week? Last week it was, what is a suicide? And if you weren't with us, it basically is uh, taking, making false assumptions. Matter of fact, I'll read you a definition we used last week. A suicide is when we make false assumptions about others, portraying them in the worst possible light with the end being damage, if not the destruction of a relationship. And so I'm really looking at this from the perspective of relationships. And yet, you know, this last couple of weeks, I've kind of been thinking about this and it's amazing to me how many things we really assume every single day. And I don't know how it's been around your house, but since I started this series, uh, Jenny and I, whenever one of us is guilty of it, you know, uh, we've been calling each other out on it. A suicide, a suicide. <laughs> Has anybody else done that this week or has it just been our family? And uh, it's kind of amazing how many times you do that. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about it today. But since it is Thanksgiving, uh, I'm going to take a couple minutes and um, I want to have you guys, uh, if, you, if you would like, um, give a, maybe a, just a very brief word of testimony about what you're thankful for. But I'm going to bring this down to um, a little bit more guidelines. And it would be this. Uh, I, we're talking about relationships this morning, and so I want you to give a, somebody in a personal relationship that you're thankful for. Now, I'm going to narrow it a little bit more. Um, because I know every marriage in here is really happy, um, I don't want it to be your spouse, or I don't really want it to be anybody in your family. I know you're thankful for your wife. I know you're thankful for your kids. At least I hope you are. Um, and one more caveat, I don't want it to be me or Jenny. I understand you're here this morning, and you might like us, and we feel very loved and very much gratitude. I, I really want to talk about everybody as a church family, and so if you would have somebody that God may, you know, lay in your heart this moment that's part of our church family that you're thankful for, and you'd be willing to say it publicly, <laughs> um, uh, so be it. Anybody? Tell me somebody in the church, maybe Muffy? Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm thankful for Jerry as well. Yes, Anna. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Caleb and Blossom, they're, they're uh, Oklahoma. I think in Oklahoma. They're somewhere. Alaska. <laughs> Oklahoma. Alaska. <laughs> You know, one week blossoms in the Philippines, you know, you just never quite know where they're going to, where the, where the Downing family might be. Yeah, Andrew? Uh, I wanted to say that I appreciate uh, Will and his family. Yeah. Every month, he spends hours, not just over here in the kitchen and back, but already at his place, getting everything prepared for us. And uh, I know he puts all his heart in it, so I, I appreciate him. Yeah. Yeah, if you're not part of our seniors ministry here, uh, you know, you should be. <laughs> Thank the Lord for Will and Dana and family. Yes, Allie. <laughs> yeah, see, if you're online, we have a healthy living class. So we have, Will's, we have Will's dinner on one night and we have the healthy living class the next night. Um, yes, it's a, re it's a repentance meal. Um, no, Will, Will only makes things that are low-cal, low-fat. That's, that's, that's what he told me he was going to do, I, you know. Um, look at all you seniors are thin and trim, um, you know. Uh, yeah, D? I know you like to pick on me, but that D.T. is very, very special. Yeah, he is. And he is the biggest inspiration. Yeah. See that, D.T.? D says you're an inspiration. 
in church. She said that. <laughs> and I heartily agree with you. Anybody else? You got somebody you want to? Uh, yes, Mel. I'm thankful for the Lord. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Lori, uh, Mel says, Lori, that you're a great friend to her, as different as you guys are. They started hanging around together, and I'm going, oh no, something's going to break here. Something is going to break. Uh, but I think it's the way the body of Christ is supposed to work, you know? Um, really good. Anybody else you're thankful for? Yeah, Pastor Cody. Yeah, thankful for Howard in the midst, uh, the, the example of joy is in the midst of trials. Yeah, I am thankful for Howard very, very much. Amen. Anybody else? Yeah, Jen? I'm thankful for Debbie. No matter what life throws at her, she is always there with a smile. I'm for Debbie. Yeah. How about that? See? See? They're smiling, they're smiling back there now. <laughs> That's good. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Russ. Yeah. About what? Cooking. <laughs> I was going to start the list of what you could learn from Will. Um, I was going to have uh, Dana and Margaret start comparing notes. Says, hey, has he learned anything? Uh, no, he hasn't learned anything. Uh, Ross, you're the best. Yeah, we are thankful. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I uh, thankful for Martha and Andrew. I I am as well, and they 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 run the uh, the activity and side of the seniors, the diamonds, and they have been going places. You know, I every time I see those planes fly over, and I think, and I see somebody maybe jump out, and I go, there goes Wanda Faye. Um, you know, oh, you guys didn't get to fly in them though, did you? You didn't get. To, have you even gotten? Have you gotten in it? You haven't even gotten in them yet, have you? Come on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, your wife is a chief. I mean, what, 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 the, 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 what good is all that rank if you if you can't pull it every now and then? So, I know, poor, poor Andrew. Yes. Oh, you are. Yeah, I heard Woody. <laughs> she said she was just as nervous as if you were getting married. Is that what she said? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it was a big event, you know, that was Caitlin's Castle yesterday. And I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that Woody played the part of the court jester slash fool. Um, just, just kidding. Matt was playing. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, I can, it's coming, Matt. I got that picture already. Woody already airdropped it to me. Um, oh, you guys are great. Steven. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, every year, Brother Matt does a wonderful job with the men's camp out, and, uh, you know, that was great. Uh, you're right. Um, very generous. All right, you guys, that was good. Yeah, I, I see Angie, see that hand, it's blinding back there. I can't tell if it's the sun or your radiance. I can't tell which it is, but... <laughs> yeah, I'm thankful for Cody and Erica. It's just, oh, that's a blessing. Um, um, very, very, very much so. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Russ. Boy, we're going to recirculate. Yeah. They and, and Charles are thankful for the example they give to us for a long, long relationship. Yeah. 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 You talk about somebody who had to get over a suicide. Um, <laughs> Dean Charles would have to be. <laughs> So if, if my notes don't make any sense today, just see Dee and Charles after church and they'll, they'll fix anything that, that, I, that, I, that I say. 
Yes, ma'am. It is. I know. We don't want to leave anybody out, do we? Yes. I, I got to tell you, we, we are blessed with that way. Um, and, you know, I know we get on each other's nerves. And that's really why, you know, in the midst of Thanksgiving, I was going to do a real typical Thanksgiving series. And God planted me on this passage of Scripture. And I just felt this is what the Lord wanted us to study for a little bit. Because it, it, managing relationships is, is, is difficult. And yet, the greatest joys that we have to be thankful for around this time of the year really ultimately is not things, is it? It's people. And, and oftentimes this time of year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, we, we remember or we think about those that we don't have this side of eternity. And it reminds us to be really thankful. And yet, if we don't manage those in our family and in our church family, then it can result in, in disaster. And that's what a suicide is and what we're going to be talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 in your Bibles this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, just a way of, of background, uh, remember that this is written to believers that the church at Corinth, they had a lot of problems with that church, but they were believers. They had come to a place in their life where they received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and received the free gift of eternal life. These are, these are Christian people, but they had a lot of problems. And Christian people do. And remember, we studied last week that Paul in 1 Corinthians had told him he was going to stop by, and then he didn't. And then he sent him another letter saying, I'm going to, I'm going to come again and maybe even make two, two trips to you. And he didn't make either one of those. And so the people there at the church, some of them got offended. And some of them began to make assumptions about why Paul didn't come. Matter of fact, so much so that there appears there was a division in the church and somebody came forward to kind of challenge Paul's authority and his apostleship. And so history tells us that Paul wrote them a letter um, between 1st and 2nd Corinthians, not a, it's not part of scripture, and rebuked them and directed them to deal with some issues in the church that they hadn't dealt with. And then write Second Corinthians to kind of be a, 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 a word of encouragement that God gives to us as inspired scripture. And so last week we looked at what a suicide is. And today I, I have entitled this, today's message, The Suicide Antidote. How do we fix or how do we avoid or when, when it happens, how do we deal with it? So uh, quickly today, I want to go into Second Corinthians chapter number two. And look at this topic of how do we, uh, do we fix a suicide? But before I get there, let me pray and then we'll get into God's word today. Lord, thank you for the time we've enjoyed together uh, as Christians, as brothers and sisters, as a church family. Lord, uh, we recognize that it, it, it's difficult sometimes to, to manage relationships. And God, help us to be people of wisdom. Uh, thank you for the example that you give us and preserved in your word. And this morning, may your word uh, speak to each of our hearts as the truth that it brings forth. And uh, God, I pray that uh, the words, uh, the vessel, you just use me as a vessel and that your spirit would speak. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. Uh, number one, the first thing, how do we deal with the relational suicide? Now, like I said, there's a lot of different things things you can, you can do assumptions on, and, and we do, but I'm focusing mainly on the issue of relationships, marriage, family, and specifically here, it would be a church relationship. Well, the first thing we find, if you want to deal with it, if it's happened, whether you've been victim of it, or maybe you have been guilty of it, and I think we've all been on both sides of it, where someone's said something about you and assumed it about you, or you've done that to someone else. Well, here's what needs to happen. The first thing we find is we're going to pick up in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 is confrontation. Confrontation is essential to ending a, a suicide or to fixing it. Uh, look at verse number 2. Paul writes and says, For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me? In other words, he's saying, I don't, I, you know, not my purpose is not to make you all sad. You're my joy. Verse 3, and I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow of them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you should know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. So Paul wrote them this letter that I referred to to rebuke them and to challenge this person who was causing division in the church. 
And Paul writes this letter, and unlike today, where you can pick up the phone and call, or you can email or text or Instagram or whatever, you know, Snapchat, none of that was available, obviously. And so a letter was the, the most direct thing he could do. And what Paul does is he confronts the issue. When he found out there were folks that were assuming why he did not come, he didn't just let it lay there, but he confronted it. And in any relationship you have, if you're not willing to have confrontation, then your relationships will never be what they ought to be. None of us really like, well, I shouldn't say some of us do like confrontation, but most of us do not. We, we, we resist it. And, and, and I'm not trying to say that everything we're going to talk about in a minute has to be confronted all the time. But when a suicide has happened to the, to the level that there's division in a relationship, confrontation is in order. Now, when I say that word, I think most of you think uh, uh, very negatively. Is that fair to say? If, I'm gonna, if I were to say to you, I'm going to have a confrontation with you after the service, you know, you don't want to hear that, do you, Brother Matt? Um, you know, <laughs> meet with me and Matt in the church office. It's not always a good thing. Um, but he's not meaning it to be negative, and I don't really mean to give it a negative connotation. I, I think in the, in the respect that when confrontation is done, as long as it is done, as Paul writes here, out of many tears, and he was grieved in heart, and he did it that ye might know the love that I have for you. So his, his confrontation was not based on, hey, I'm right, you're wrong, you did this, and, and, and attacking in nature. Matter of fact, you know what the Bible says about that in, in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 10. The Bible is really clear that, that only by uh, pride cometh contention. Uh, and, and so in those things, we know that when there's contention apart from this kind of love and grieving, that it is a type of pride that one person saying, you know, trying to show up the other person and demonstrate how smart we are. That is not what Paul was trying to do. Paul did this with brokenness and out of love. And so when there's a confronting of, of an issue, that is the spirit in which it needs to be done. That's why, by the way, we discipline out of love. Why you ought to confront your children. It's not always easy. Matter of fact, it's hard work. When you have small children, and they're, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's a battle. And, and yet, if you allow your children to do whatever they want to do, and there's never any, any confrontation, is that, are you not doing it? You say, well, I don't want to do that because I, I love them. No, no, no. If you love them, you will confront them. Now, if you confront them only in a spirit of pride and you, not, you don't do it out of brokenness and love, that can have a very bad effect as well. I'm not advocating here this morning that everything your child does, you're in their grill yelling at them. You, you need to choose this, and we're going to discuss this in a moment, wisely. And yet, confrontation is essential in the management of any relationship. By the way, do not our children make assumptions? <laughs> you bet they make assumptions. And if you don't deal with them, their assumptions will become reality. I wanted my children, and I think one of them's here, if you want to check with her. She made the assumption when she was a child, if she stepped out of line and I told her to do something, she didn't do it. She had an assumption that something was coming. Matter of fact, it went beyond assumption. She had a certainty of it. Do you see how that happens? You can make that assumption work to a certainty one way or the other. And parenting is hard, and boy, I certainly didn't do it perfect, but I'm telling you, confrontation is part of it. You see, ultimately, confrontation is about gaining truth and understanding. It's not primarily about, you know, me being right. It's about gaining the perspective of what is truth. I, I found a little picture, and I thought, you know, maybe uh, you can relate to this in, in, um, in, in your relationship, maybe if uh, in a spouse, but how about this one? To save time, let's just assume I'm never wrong. <laughs> That'd make the argument and discussion a lot shorter, wouldn't it? And some of you and all of us probably a time or two have been guilty of that kind of attitude. You know, I find it difficult this last couple of weeks I've been really thinking about this. Where does assumption end and certainty begin? That's not an easy answer all the time, is it? Uh, most of the time when we make an assumption, I, I think if you're of any age, have any level of wisdom, most of us hope we grow beyond the, the, the stage where we just make some wild assumption on somebody. We tend to make an assumption because we get a couple things that we believe to be factually true. And by the way, they may be factually true. 
It was factually true that Paul said he was going to come to Corinth and did not. That was factually true. But from a valid fact became a lot of assumptions that were not true. And it can be really difficult at times to, to where is that balance to where I'm, I, I feel like I've done enough, enough dis, uh, discernment and confrontation and seeking out the facts that I now know. I think that takes a lot of prayer. You see, ultimately, people that don't want to do confrontation, which is most of us, I want you to think about really the reality of this. I, I found a quote from some lady, I think she's a, a therapist of some kind, Margaret Tartakovsky, I think how you say her name, but she said this, assuming, or in my case, assumicide is a form of passiveness. It doesn't require any real effort or action, which are both vital to keeping relationships moving in a positive direction. You know, it's a lot easier for me just to make an assumption about what you think and what you did and then act upon it than it is for me really to get up off my backside and go investigate and go have a conversation where we deal with an issue and say, I need to really understand what you meant here or what these facts are. It's, it's a whole lot easier for us just to sit there and, and in our own little passiveness and, and make a bunch of assumptions and yet be certain in our pride that we have a true understanding of what's going on. And yeah, that person's really a jerk. And boy, they really, they said this. I know they did. Do you now? And we use that as an excuse to not go find out what the real truth is. So number one step in repairing and, and the antidote to a suicide is confrontation. The second uh, thing is consequence. Notice in verse 5 and 6, Paul goes on and says, But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Paul says, if you hurt me, it's, you, you, you know, I've just been hurt a little bit, but ultimately you've hurt all of us. You see, when you make a wrong assumption about somebody and you begin to develop a wrong or a critical negative attitude towards them, and you begin to spread that or you, you sin against them, there's a price for it. Understand that the assumptions you make inside of relationships, there is a cost to it. Satan's going to tell you that you can have your own little world in that, but if you really value that relationship at all or have any desire to have healthy relationships, you better learn the danger of a suicide. But once a sin has been committed, there's a price, there's a consequence. And Paul here mentions in, in verse number six, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Now, in this passage that I've read, most, most uh, Bible scholars think Paul is dealing with two issues here at, at, at one time that he's going to use in, in a matter of contrast. There are some issues of life. For example, if I were to come down, DT's not here. See, DT, if you're here, I'd do this to you. If I were just to walk down and DT's sitting there minding his own business and I come up and I smack him upside the head for nothing, I think most of you could say, that wasn't very nice. That was probably wrong of me to do, Right? Pretty clear. If I was to go out there and, you know, do something that, you know, everybody could say, well, that's wrong. And they had one of those kind of sins going on in the church of Corinth. But they also had a guy who was causing this division based on some facts, but then he was making all this a suicide on Paul and dividing the church. And Paul calls out both of them. And he says their punishment came, especially on the guy that was committed in sin, that, that, that the whole church came together and, and did church discipline. Now, we read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, this idea of such a one. People, you know, we, Paul doesn't name this individual, but most people think he's referring to what he wrote about in 1 Corinthians in chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. Paul says this, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there had been somebody in the church that was having an immoral relationship with his stepmom. And all the people went, ew, that's pretty 
sicko, isn't it? Now, understand in the day of Corinth, it probably was fairly accepted, unless we get too judgmental in our America today. We don't even know how many genders there are today. And uh, we, we, we have made no, uh, we, we believe everybody can do whatever they want to do with their, uh, with their bodies in that way. So I think we, again, are a lot like the church of Corinth. And, and so, but it was a sin. It was a sexual sin. And the, the, Paul wrote about it in 1 Corinthians and called him out and said, this is what needs to happen. But apparently the church was not only not doing that, but they were kind of saying, hey, look how tolerant we are. Look how we accepting we are of everybody. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Your glorying is not good. Don't you know a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump? In other words, if we allow and you just sit there and have a passive relationship to sin, open sin in, in the midst of the church, it affects everybody. You realize what you do affects other people. People say, well, I don't really matter in the church. Yes, you do. The attitudes that you adopt have an impact on all of us. So when there's an open sin, Paul says you, you deal with that sin and you give consequences. And that is part of the antidote because we know here in chapter in 2 Corinthians that this man repented and came back to church. And Paul is hoping that the guy that's causing division, that he will also repent and come back. Just remember that the goal was restoration, not satisfaction of those that were hurt. I mean, I like it when somebody does me wrong. I, I like it when I say, ooh, they got what they deserved. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you all feel that way every now and then, don't you? Paul's saying that the biblical mindset is consequences are there as a result of our choices that will move us back to the right kind of choices and restoration. And apparently that had been done and eventually was done there in the church of Corinth because the man repented. So there, the part of the deal is confrontation. And then if there's wrongdoing, there's consequences. But then lastly, I love my point number three. Allison did not even know this is a word. And I said, it's in your Bible. You know, shame on you. Contrary wise, there has to be confrontation and consequences. And there has to be contrary wise. Y'all got that figured out, don't you? I had to use that word. You know why, right? Because it begins with C. Come on, people. How long have you watched my outlines? If at all possible, you make them illiterate. You know, you keep them all in order. All my OCD people said amen. If you'd put any other word in there that had been with letter C, that'd be a problem. And it's right there in your Bible. Notice in verse 7, so that contrary wise, there it is, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm him, confirm your love toward him. For to this end did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Paul says, part of fixing a suicide is first a confrontation. Then if necessary, there needs to be consequences. But then thirdly, there needs to be a contrary wise. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean, you and I need to do what is contrary to what our flesh wants to do. It is hard to forgive somebody who has wronged you. It runs counter to our, our nature. God tells us through the Apostle Paul forgive him forgive you forgave the guy that was in this immoral relationship that got right and this man that's causing the division in the church over the suicide saying false things about paul forgive him because he repented now many people will quote and it's a good verse of scripture jesus said this in, in luke 17 verse 3 take heed to yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee rebuke him confrontation and if he repent forgive him contrary wise do the opposite of what your flesh wants to do. Instead of getting vengeance, you forgive him. But the key there is if he repent. You see, oftentimes when I preach these kind of messages, folks think, even victims who've been done wrong, think that if somebody that repents, if they just say, I'm sorry. Now, I think you should say, I'm sorry, and apologize. But biblical repentance is not just words. Yea, it's not even just words and emotions. I know there are some people that they repent and they say, I'm sorry, and they can even say it with tears. I'll go back to if you're a parent and you've got children. You know, you might have children like me and Allison and Stacy. Uh, I'm picking on Stacy this morning. You might have kids like us that when you punish us, we look in the eye and say, yeah, I'll do it again. 
But then there's those kind of kids that, you know, you, you tell them you were naughty and then they start crying. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, you have the, you know, I don't know. Is that how Melissa was? Is that how Melissa was? I don't know. Uh, no. Dorothy Nush wasn't that way. That's how Caleb was, right? That's uh, Allison's going to say, yeah, that's how her brother was. You know, and I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But as soon as mom and dad leave the room, ha, ha, ha I fooled them. They can cry and whine and, you know, you, some of you, you know, we're so easily fooled by our children, you know. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. No, they just don't want the consequences. And many times, even in the Christian world, we're, people like me tell people like you, if someone says they're sorry, that you have this inherent responsibility that you just have to, you have to forgive them. Now, I would always tell you unilaterally forgive, but I don't think that the relationship can be restored until there's genuine repentance on the part of the other person. And you say, well, how can you do that? Well, Paul would later write in this very letter about this very issue, because how do I know if the person's really repenting or not? And, and that's why he writes in chapter 7 of this book, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10, he says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, because I'm not happy that the, my letter hurt your feelings, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage uh, by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, in that verse 10, where he's talking about repentance to salvation, he's not talking about getting saved and going to heaven. He's talking in relationships there that when you repent, genuine repentance, it leads to salvation. It leads to deliverance inside a relationship. In other words, if you have a marriage and you got problems and you're fighting one another and you're doing things to one another and you don't repent inside your relationship, you don't come to one another and say, hey, I hurt your feelings. I did a wrong action there. I am sorry. And you don't mean it and, and are willing to take responsibility. That will destroy your marriage. It will. It, it, same thing, truth in a church. He says, if you have godly sorrow, it, it, it brings deliverance. It brings salvation. But if you have worldly sorrow, it brings death. If, if you, you say, what is worldly sorrow? How can I tell the difference? Well, um, here's, here's a couple key points without doing a whole sermon on this. Godly sorrow expresses the ultimate sin is against God. When somebody, when you realize you've done something wrong, the first thing as a believer you should do stock with is, I did a wrong choice. The first person I violated was him. I did not act in the character of Christ that I should have done. The second thing you can tell is that somebody that's genuinely repentant will be willing to accept the consequences. If they really understand that they did something wrong and it's a legitimate wrong, and they're broken before God, they'll accept the consequences. They may not like it, but they'll accept it. But if the first thing, like in, in, in marriage relationships where there's big problems and, and one person says, well, because you've done this wrong, I need you to be accountable. I need you to phone before you leave work. I need you to call me every day before you leave work so I know you've left and then I know you'll be home in 10 minutes. I've had some men say, well, I ain't doing that. You know, that's, I, you, you just don't trust me. No, we don't trust you because you just messed up. And when they begin with that attitude, it immediately tells me that it is not genuine repentance. It also doesn't demand. You see, when folks are not genuine in repentance, they usually say something like this when the consequences are given. Hey, I said I was sorry. I said I was sorry. I said I was sorry. And if any consequence comes, then all of a sudden you're the bad guy. That is not genuine repentance. Now, I still think as a believer, you need to unilaterally forgive them for your own benefit, and that's what God commands you to do. But if you don't see that, I, don't, I would tell you, you need to be very careful inside of that relationship until God breaks them. See, Paul says, and God says to this church, these people had genuinely repented. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they fixed it, but they were genuinely trying to do the right thing. Paul says, comfort him in verse 7 and 8, and also uh, uh, comfort and confirm him. In other words, once somebody does that, there's a responsibility we have at some point along the way to come up and give that person 
a hug. Now, if it's an appropriate hug, okay? <laughs> you don't find the prettiest girl in church and say, hey, I, I forgive you. Let me give you a hug. Um, <laughs> don't do that or you'll have other relationship problems. We'll be back to square one. But it, the, the, I think the, there's a biblical responsibility than to go back to that relationship and do restoration and edification. And if a suicide has been done, yes, there needs to be confrontation. Yes, there needs to be consequence. But there needs to be some contrary wise that we, don't, we do what our flesh does not want to do. And we go make restoration inside that, that relationship. And the one that has done wrong, who is now broken over their sin, who now feels, and trust me, we've all been there. Boy, I, I just, boy, I'm a lousy husband. I'm a lousy whatever it is I've done wrong there. You know, th th that Satan uses that, doesn't he? And there's nothing like when you've done wrong, and I can tell you inside our church family where we've had to deal with some issues, and I've been with folks who've done some things wrong but then repented of them, there's nothing like when other church people come around them and put their arm around them and say, you know what, what you did was wrong, but I'm so thankful you, you confessed it and you're forsaking it. I want you to know that I still love you, and I'm so thankful that you're part of my life. Ooh, that'll build relationships. Paul says, ultimately, do it for Jesus' sake. That's what he ends in verse 10. I forgave in the person of Christ. Now, this is important. Why? And I want to end with this this morning. Verse 11 says, lest Satan should gain an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, I don't know. When I get to Paul, I'll ask him. I'll say, Paul, I don't know. I think there are a lot of our church Christians today that are ignorant of his devices. Paul tells them, if you don't deal with this, if you don't do contrary wise, if you don't do the whole process here, confrontation, consequences, forgiveness, Satan gets an advantage. And we're not ignorant of his devices. You know, Satan tried to destroy this church through sexual immorality. And many a church has been destroyed because of sexual immorality. Beginning in the pulpit which is why it's so important that Jenny and I, that I maintain her as the primary relationship in my human relationship in my life. And why I thank you guys for how you invest in us to get away um, to be together. But if you don't recognize the danger that is done and this church was being destroyed because the hand and the power of God comes off a ministry when there's rampant, immorality and this person got it right and the church got clean and they moved forward and were used of God but there was this a suicide deal going on and it find it ironic Satan says you know I tried to ruin the church through some open sin that everybody agrees is wrong and that didn't work but then I'll go through the back door and I'll get one Christian to say, hey, I heard, you know what I heard about him? That's the guy that cheated on his, his wife. Get it? And we begin to say things and assume things about other people, commit a suicide. And over time, it creates division inside of a church. And I'm just telling you, God help the person that is guilty of that. I don't say this lightly. I, I was not always a senior pastor I grew up in church, and I'm just telling you, whether it's in this life or the next, and usually it's in this life, some of the most bitter, empty people are people that chose to rip a church apart through gossip and division and lack of forgiveness. You better forgive other people because I can guarantee you one thing, you're going to need it yourself one day. You see, if you don't take the antidote, it'll ultimately d divide the church. It'll make the church le less effective and ultimately can destroy a church. Same truth in marriage. You got to forgive. I, I was reading a, a history about um, a Spanish patriot. Uh, patriot uh, his name was uh, Navarez. I think is how you say it. I should ask uh, Oscar if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't even know who he, this guy is totally, but he was this great leader, military leader, and he was lying, dying on the battlefield. And his father, who was a priest, came to him and asked him during confession to make things right. Is there anybody you need to forgive? And his son looked at his father and said, Father, this is what he said, Father, I do not have to forgive my enemies. I have had them all shot. 
And, you know, a lot of us, we don't have a lot of whole enemies that we say we don't have to forgive because we just, anybody that hurts us, we just shoot the relationship. We just kill it. And you see, these kind of assumptions ruin relationships. I was reading, as I was studying, I was reading from a counseling center that said, why do these assumptions ruin relationships? They said it causes assumptions. A suicide leads you to shut down. You quit trying. It creates constant tension and conflict. It means you don't see, you don't let other people see your good side because you're so busy making assumptions that you're always defensive. And ultimately, if you make a suicide, part of the pattern of your choices, I'm going to promise you this, it's going to lead you to loneliness. You will be a very lonely person. Now, there's a lot of causes for loneliness. I don't want to be guilty of being judgmental here. I'm not my, but I would ask you, if you feel like you're really lonely, I would ask you to consider, are you guilty of making a bunch of assumptions in relationships in your life? Maybe some of the facts you think you know, you need to reevaluate. Because what you've done by making these assumptions is you've built a, a wall around yourself. Because this is the real reality, and this is a temptation that people like my personality are tempted to. The reason that one of the reasons we like to make assumptions on others, it allows me to have the need or the ability to control other people in the situation. If I don't ask you how you think, then I can make an assumption of how you think and have it the way I want it to be. Gives me a reason and excuse not to like you. Puts me back in the driver's seat. I read this quote from a, this counseling center. Uh, they said assumptions can also be a way of avoiding emotional pain. By always assuming we know what others think and feel, we avoid the risk of being vulnerable. We block out feedback that might hurt, but by doing so, we also sadly block out learning the good things others would like to share with us, including genuine, real affection and love. You see, making assumptions is thus a habit of those who have a fear, get this now, of intimacy. Do you know what most people when they come to a local church really want? Most people come and they say, I really want to feel like I'm a part of something. I want to feel like people really care. And that's a le legitimate desire when you come to a body of Christ, and I, it's something I desire. It's one of the advantages, I would say, of big churches. Yeah, big churches can have all kinds of programs, blah, blah, blah. And that, all good. Love the big churches. If you're a big church, we love you. You can do things we can't. But the relational end at a small church, the multi-generational relationships you can have in a smaller church are priceless. But there are many people that are very lonely, and one of the reasons is you're not willing to come to the truth. The reason you, you don't have these things is you make assumptions about people that you don't like because that way you can assign to them their motives and what they're doing and why they do it, and you can judge them. But if you keep doing that, pretty soon you'll find yourself very much alone. Because as that quote said, every decent, deep, desired relationship only occurs with vulnerability. With vulnerability. We don't like making ourselves vulnerable. And the reason we don't like it is oftentimes it's because we've been hurt in the past. Somebody did you wrong. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm just going to put my walls up and if somebody says something, I just make an assumption. I don't want to go confront it because I don't want to know. Now, if you're okay living alone, that's your choice. But understand what you're doing. It, it, it's like if, if you sit around the campfire and pick the men's camp out, for example, or you sit around maybe after church or you maybe go out to a meal with someone, I would certainly tell you that you should learn someone's character before you start spilling your guts, okay? There certainly are people that are, are not trustworthy. There are. But ultimately, none of us are perfectly trustworthy. We all disappoint one another. But in that sit down, some people think that transparency equals vulnerability, and it does not. In other words, 
I can say, I'm really being transparent. I'm, I'm telling you things about myself. But you know the thing about that is, I choose what I want to tell you. I'm in control. The difference between being transparent and being vulnerable is this. When you're vulnerable, you allow that other person to see inside of you. That's scary. And yet, the very thing that most people want in a marriage or even inside of a church is that kind of intimacy. But somewhere along the way, we got burned and we started putting our walls up and we justify it by making these assumptions. But as Paul wrote, the very best joys are when we enjoy intimate relationships. And that's why when Paul writes this, I would make the argument that in verse number four, Paul uses very intimate words. Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears that you should not be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Paul bears his heart. And sometimes that's dangerous. You see, a suicide kills. Unforgiveness brings bitterness. It brings anger. It brings revenge. It brings division. It brings destruction. And Satan wins. Now, this morning, and I'm going to close with this. And I'm sorry I went along. It's because you all talked longer on, our, on my thankfulness thing. It's your fault, okay? Um, you, you, somebody does you wrong, and you're making, you, you go and get information, and, and you figure out, you know, you go have a confrontation, get some information. There's some consequences. Now you have to decide, how do you want to deal with a hurt? There's two different perspectives I want to share with you, and I would basically tell you, choose one of them. Two different kind of pers perspectives. The first one, I want to use two different illustrations. First illustration I'd give you is, let's just say, and this is for DT. DT, if you're watching, this is for you. Let's just say that I, out of the generosity of my heart, because I'm a really generous guy, I decide that I'm going to give DT... Every day, I'm going to automatically deposit in his bank account $86,400 a day. I think, I, you know, imagine you woke up every single day with $86,400 in your bank account. Would you all like that? Uh, it'd be pretty good, right, DT? I'm doing that. Now, DT, I, I, I give him this $86,400, and DT, being the nice guy he is, he decides to bring some cash to church, and he brings a bunch of $10 bills with him to church one Sunday morning, and He's talking about how he has some $10 bills and he leaves one of them on his chair during fellowship time and DT gets up and he walks around and that particular morning sitting right behind him is none other than Michael Bryant. Now Michael Bryant's sitting behind him and DT comes back from fellowship time and the $10 bill is gone and Michael Bryant's sitting back there with a big smile on his face. And DT turns around to Michael Bryant and says, did you take my $10 bill? And as you can see through his white shirt, you know, you can see the $10 bill through his pocket. Michael Bryant says, I didn't see any $10 bill. Now, DT can do a couple things. He can take his cane and whap him upside the head, knock him unconscious, and take his $10 bill out. But if you knew that every single day you were going to get $86,400, how much would you sweat the $10? Would it keep you up all night? Wouldn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> 10 bucks, man. Knock yourself out, Michael O'Brien. Go get yourself a couple Starbucks. I got $86,390 new every day. Now, the, the illustration with this goes like this. Really, you've all, we've all been given 86,400 seconds a day. And yet you and I, and I am really guilty of this, we let somebody with 10 seconds of our time say a few words and demand every bit of the other 86,390 seconds. Let it go. Most of the issues in life inside the church, if we are in love with Christ, if we're secure in Christ, the number one thing that we ought to do with people that hurt us when they say something is let it go. But if you cannot let it go, then you need to take option two, which I'm going to illustrate by the life of one of our glorious presidents, James Garfield. Anybody know him? James Garfield is our 20th president. Uh, what a wonderful man. He was only in office uh, six months before he was assassinated. All right, so he was not one of the lucky ones. Matter of fact, one of the great things, I heard, I heard secret out there. I'm going to assume that was secret sneezing. Um, <laughs> was my assumption valid? Or was that Sarah? No? Okay, no. 
Who was it? It was Wanda. Okay, then my assumption is thus proved. All right, there's been confrontation, there's been consequences in contrary ways. I love it. Um, this guy was the 20th president, and he got assassinated. He was only in office for six months, and somebody got mad at him, came up behind him, and shot him in the back. What a wimp. All right? But the story goes that, that they shot him in the back. It didn't hit a vital organ, and they, they tried to get the bullet out, and this was after the Civil War, and the, there, was the, there was the scientific argument going on about germs, but his doctors weren't buying it, so they were still doing the old-fashioned way, and the, the, the doctor knew he needed to get the bullet out, so he literally took his pinky finger and t stuck his pinky finger in the hole and trying to find that, find that bullet. Doesn't that make you squirm a little bit? <laughs> and he couldn't get the bullet out. And so they transported uh, President Garfield down to some hospital in Washington, D.C., and he hung on for six months. And they said that basically every few days they would hope that the bullet would move, you know, that the body would try to work its way out. And, and the doctor would come back in and it would stick his finger in the wound again and try and find that bullet. Matter of fact, they got so desperate, the story goes, they called Alexander Graham Bell, who was doing all the electric stuff with the telephone and brought him bring in his wires to see if with the wires they could find the metal. But even Alexander Graham Bell, hello, is it in there? Uh, didn't work, apparently. And the story goes that more than likely, if when he was shot in the back and they figured out they couldn't get the bullet out, if they would have just cleaned out the wound and patched up the wound, he probably would have lived. But instead, every few days over six months, they kept reinserting a filthy finger <laughs> inside of that wound. And you know what happened. It got infected and he died from the infection. The moral of the story is, if somebody wounds you in your back and you can't get the bullet out, but instead, every few days when Satan brings it up, you try to dig it back out unsuccessfully without forgiving it, it will kill you. So let go of the 10 bucks or for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, let him do some surgery on you and pull that bullet out and let it go. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the teaching of your word today. Lord, help us in our relationships, both in the church and our marriages. Oh, Lord, we're oftentimes so guilty of making assumptions. And yet at times, Lord, our assumptions are correct and people hurt us. Uh, Lord, uh, help us to be like you in that we are people of forgiveness, um, recognizing that each day is new and that your mercy is uh, never ending. Lord, I pray that I'm sure there's some here listening either by way of Facebook or YouTube uh, uh, that have been hurt very, very deeply. Uh, Lord, we seek, do not seek to minimize those hurts and uh, Lord, they need to be dealt with. But Lord, I pray that we could live with close friends that all of us desire to have close human relationships inside the church and our family. Forgive us when we've committed the sin of a suicide. Lord, I pray if there's one here today who doesn't know you as their personal Savior, may this be the day they choose you. Would you simply do that, my friend, by faith? How about it, dear Christian? Is there something in your life you need to let go of it? Or is there something that you need to let God to take that bullet out? Is there a need to get some healing today? Holy Spirit, take this time of invitation. Use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.